So if you've ever been there, you know, in that metaphorical control room. Oh, yeah. Watching a huge model training run. We're talking months of planning. A serious cloud budget. At 3 in the morning, of course. Exactly. At 3 a.m. And it just suddenly goes sideways. That feeling of panic. It's a terrible feeling. Well, this issue of architectural instability at scale is the painful expensive problem we are digging into today. And what's so fascinating about the work we're looking at, the SteepSeek MHC, is that their goal was um, so much deeper than just chasing a leaderboard number. Right. They're trying to fundamentally fix a scaling trick, the original hyperconnections idea, which just proved too fragile. They're really asking, can the width of that residual stream be a reliable scaling dimension, not just some high-risk hack? That's a great way to frame it. So let's set our mission for this discussion. DeepSeek MHC takes that unstable idea, keeps the wider stream, but clamps it with a strict mathematical constraint. Forcing it to behave like a stable identity map, even across hundreds of layers. Exactly. We're going to explore that architectural solution and also why the uh, sheer amount of systems engineering needed was just as critical. Absolutely. So we're jumping straight into the source material, starting with the core concept. Let's really nail down the original idea of hyperconnections and, you know, why it failed. Okay. The HCC idea was exciting. It widens that residual stream from the standard, say, C channels to a multiple, like N times C. Like turning a one-lane highway into a four-lane highway. Exactly. And then the model learns how to mix and route information between those parallel streams. It sounds great on paper because you get a lot more representational capacity, but without the quadratic FLOP's cost of just making the whole layer bigger. But this is where the risk comes in. This is where the risk comes in. The standard yeah. residual connection, you know, output equals input plus the function, that's your stability rail. It gives signals and gradients a clean, predictable path. And the original hyperconnections just broke that contract, right? right. Completely. When you introduce an unconstrained, learnable mixing matrix in each layer, that stability guarantee is just gone. And it compounds. It compounds wildly across layers. And we know it fails because the source material shows clear evidence of this. The authors mention a sharp loss surge right around the 12,000 step mark. That specific number, 12,000 steps, that's where it really goes off the cliff. But the paper also mentions something called the Amax gain magnitude peaking around 3,000. What is that, and why is that number so terrifying? That's such an essential point. The Amex gain magnitude, it, uh, it basically measures how much the biggest value in your signal gets amplified going through one layer. Okay. For stability, you want that number to be very, very close to one if it hits 3,000. The signal is 3,000 times bigger coming out than going in. Exactly. That is the mathematical definition of a signal explosion. It's numerical runaway. That's why the training loss spikes. Right. So the core problem is that amplification across depth. And the deep sea MHC fix is designed to prevent that. It is. It projects that critical mixing matrix onto a, well, a really specific, mathematically beautiful set of matrices, the manifold of doubly stochastic matrices. Also called the Birkhoff polytope. That's the one. And this constraint isn't just arbitrary. It forces the mixing to be non-expansive and compositionally predictable. It brings back that stability contract, and they use the Sinkhorn NOP algorithm to enforce it. And before we get into the math of that, we have to talk about the systems side of this. We saw it in Table 1 in the article. What good is a stable architecture if it slows your training down by 50%? Precisely. The bottleneck in big models isn't usually FLOPs anymore. It's the memory wall, the speed of moving data. Yeah. Widening that residual stream, even with no new FLOPs, it just explodes your memory traffic. So they had to do some serious low-level work. Oh, serious work on kernel fusion and recompute? Uh -huh. That's how they got the training time overhead down to only 6.7% with an expansion rate of 4, which is, frankly, phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so moving beyond the fix itself, the bigger problem they were tackling is that width is really this missing scaling knob. It is. We're all used to scaling with more compute, more data, better data. But this is an architectural dial you can turn. Why is it so appealing? Well, think about why standard transformers work. That residual connection is super conservative. It's a single express elevator for gradients. The hyperconnections insight was to ask, why just one lane? Right. Why not more? Especially since the expansion rate N can be tiny compared to the channel size C. The article mentions N equals 4 versus C being, say, 4096. The added compute is just negligible. So it becomes a cheap way to scale performance to shift that compute quality curve. Exactly. More power for almost the same compute budget. If And it's a big if. You can handle the memory traffic. Which brings us back to the basics. 
The original residual connection is defined by that input goes through untouched property. That's the stable backbone. That's the stability contract. It is non-negotiable. If you mess with that identity behavior, you have to replace it with something equally strong. And HC didn't. HC unilaterally violated the contract without offering any replacement. It just put a learnable, unconstrained matrix in the path and hoped for the best. Which explains the blow up. Even with its clever pre-maps and post-maps, it was doomed at scale. The problem is what's called compositional closure. A single one of those mixing matrices looks fine. It's just a linear transformation. But you multiply 100 of them together. And the composite transformation fails to preserve basic properties like the global mean. It has to lead to unbounded amplification or attenuation. The result is instability, that loss surge, and metrics like the Amax gain magnitude just going off the rails. So let's try a simple analogy for you, the listener, for the MHC fix. Imagine those parallel residual lanes. HCC was a free-for-all, drive wherever you want. Right. Deep Seek MHC installs a strict conservation law. It's like having rules for lane changes that guarantee you can't create new cars out of thin air, you can't make cars disappear, and every car that enters must eventually exit. And the mathematical version of that law is forcing the matrix to be doubly stochastic. Meaning? Non-negative entries, every row sums to one and every column sums to one. And the authors of the source material detail three huge benefits from this. What are they? First, norm preservation. The spectral norm is guaranteed to be less than or equal to one, so the mapping is non-expansive. It directly stops gradient explosion. Okay, that's one. Second, compositional closure. Mm. You multiply two doubly stochastic matrices and you get another one. So stability survives across a deep model. And third, a geometric meaning. It's a soft blend of permutations. The mixing is always about routing and shuffling, never about amplification. So practically speaking, that constraint is what stops the blowups. If the rows sum to one, the output is a convex combination of the inputs. You literally cannot inflate the signal. And the non-negative entries stop what you could call cancellation games, where big positive and negative numbers fight each other and amplify a numerical noise. It's a different philosophy. It really is. HLE was about adding expressive routing. MHC added a routing constitution. This closure property prevents that quiet drift away from identity that eventually kills the training run. But a constitution is only good if you can enforce it. They use the Syncor NOP algorithm. Is that practical? Does it add a ton of compute? It's pretty efficient. You exponentiate the entries to make them positive, then you just alternate normalizing the rows and columns until it converges. And they made a practical choice there. A very smart engineering trade-off. They use a max of 20 iterations instead of chasing perfect precision. But there's another subtle detail here. They also use sigmoid-based constraints on the input and output mappings to keep them non-negative too. And why constrain those as well? To prevent destructive cancellation. If you have non-negative values flowing into your central mixing matrix, you minimize the risk of creating these huge opposing signals that can cancel out locally but cause instability globally. It just shows a really deep understanding of the whole system. So what did all this engineering actually get them? I mean, stability was the goal, but did it kill the expressivity? Not at all. For their 27B models, the constrained MHC completely mitigated the instability. You get a stable gradient norm and a final loss reduction of 0 0.021 compared to the baseline. It just mm -hmm. it works. And the downstream performance, because that's the real test. Looking at table two in the article, we see real gains. We do. On the BBH reasoning benchmark, MHC gets a 51.0. That's a huge jump over the baseline's 43.8, and it's also better than the unstable HC's 48.9. Same story for the reading comprehension DROPF1. Same story. MHC hits 53.9, which beats both the unstable HC and the baseline by a good margin. The stability constraint didn't just prevent failure, it actually unlocked the performance that was hiding in that wider residual stream all along. Which leads us perfectly into why the system section of the paper isn't just a footnote, it's half the story. The architecture is brilliant, but we have to talk about the memory wall. Right. When you widen the stream from C to N times C, the amount of data you have to access for every single token just skyrockets. You hit your memory bandwidth bottleneck almost immediately. Now, this is where the skeptical part of me has to push back. Mm -hmm. They report a 6.7% overhead. Yeah. That seems optimistic. Does that just mean runtime FLOPs? because writing custom CEDA code is not cheap. That 6.7% is the runtime throughput overhead, yes. 
and it's a monumental achievement. The source material details how they did it. CUDA kernel fusion makes precision. But the key was a bandwidth aware fusion. That was the key. Give us the hard numbers on the memory savings because that's where the rubber meets the road. Okay, so the optimization cut the required memory reads from a theoretical max of 3M plus 1C down just N plus 1C, and the writes went from 3NC to NC. So for you listening, if that sounds like jargon, just know that cutting memory reads by a factor of three or more is the difference between scaling and completely stalling your hardware. Mm. This is the realization we need to hammer home. Ideas do not scale, implementations do. Without fighting that memory traffic at a low level, the architectural gains are just irrelevant. You'd burn your budget before you saw any benefit. And it gets even more complex in distributed training. With pipeline parallelism, a wider stream can mean n times the communication cost, creating these huge bubbles where GPUs are just idle. So they had to fix that too. They did. They extended the dual pipe schedule to overlap that extra work, making sure the GPU stayed busy. And that's how they could back up that 6.7% overhead number for an NU4 expansion. It's a fully integrated solution. So if we step back and look at the big picture of AI scaling laws, yeah. where does this fit? The paper positions residual width as a truly additional scaling dimension. It's not a replacement for more compute or more data, it complements them. The strategic advantage being you get better quality to similar FLOPs. You're enabling that residual path to carry and fuse more complex information. And the scaling experiments suggest that this advantage holds up as compute budgets rise. It seems to be a new knob that keeps working as you scale, which is incredible valuable. So for practical takeaways, what's the main win here? I'd say DeepSeq MHC is like a structural reinforcement beam. It restores that predictable identity-like behavior to a really powerful but unstable idea. It makes residual width safe to use. And for anyone operating large systems, the source material is so valuable because they didn't skip the hard questions. They show exactly what fails, the precise mathematical fix, and what it costs in real throughput. And for you, if you're a learner working on smaller models, you might not be writing a custom Syncorn kernel, but you should watch for open source implementations that expose this constraint. It lets you test these ideas without the risk of catastrophic failure. Looking ahead, where should we be watching? The source material points to three things. Right, first, reproductions and other code bases to see if it generalizes. Second, mapping where memory traffic becomes the final bottleneck at even larger expansion rates, like n equals eight or 16. And third. And finally, evidence that this complements other tricks like new data mixtures or different routing mechanisms. The central lesson though, is that architecture and systems engineering are now totally inseparable at scale. You absolutely cannot have one without the other. So building on everything we've discussed today, the failure of HCs, the mathematical fix, the brutal reality of memory bandwidth, I wanna leave you with a final thought. Which part of your own deep learning stack sitting on your servers right now would break first if you were to widen your model's residual highway. Something to consider as you think about the hidden cost of breaking that stability contract.